Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. And we are live on this Canada Day weekend with the MLA for Calgary Shaw, who is currently in the running to be the next leader of the UCP and ultimately the next premier of this great province of Alberta, Rebecca Schultz. Rebecca, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you in on the show today. Well, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. So, Rebecca, I have started off all my interviews the exact same way with every political candidate from every political party, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, goodness. You know, my first role in politics was way back in 2009. And I am originally from Saskatchewan, and the first job in politics I ever had was working in the Premier's office for Bradwall. And I just saw, you know, in him a type of leadership that was really all about serving people and being unwavering in terms of your values as a politician or as a party, but also showing humility and being okay with, you know, saying we made mistakes and showing compassion and yet being unwavering in terms of having a, a vision of where the province was headed. And so provincial politics was always uh, the level that I was most interested in, federal as well, but, but mostly uh, provincial uh, in my early career. And, you know, I just honestly, as this new party was coming together, the United Conservative Party here in Alberta, that was what got me involved here. And as I watched the party coming together, I wanted to make sure that my neighbors had their voices heard at the table. I wanted people to see somebody just like them uh, taking their perspectives forward and trying to change things in the province and government. So we are currently in the midst of a leadership race and you have decided to put your name forward for that position of the leader of the United Conservative Party and ultimately, like I said, the next Premier of Alberta. So the million dollar question that's on everyone's mind right now is why you, why now? Yeah, you know, for me right now, the decision was about what is in the best interest for our party and what is in the best interest of the future of this province. And I do believe that a competent conservative government focused on economic growth, a government that will defend Alberta's constitutional rights in this country, um, that is absolutely, I think, in the best interests of our province, given especially where we're at right now with, you know, jobs are up, unemployment is down, people see hope and opportunity again, uh, diversification in the economy. Like these are, I think, some of the things that our government has done very well. Um, and, you know, when I look at the future of our conservative movement and this leadership race, I don't think we need somebody for the next year or the next three years just to get us through the next election. I think we need somebody for the next decade and the next generation of our conservative movement to bring new people along and continue to grow the economy by focusing on the why, which is why do we as conservatives care about those things? It's not because, you know, for me, it's not because I love labor market stats or GDP. It's because I love people and I want to make this province better. I want to make sure that we have a good healthcare system, education system. Um, and so for me, it's about a vision for the future. You, you mentioned just in your statement there, competent conservative government. Now, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't follow up and say, are you saying that the previous conservative government that you've been serving in hasn't been competent? Or can you just clarify what you meant by competent conservative government? Yeah, you know, for us, I'm proud that I've been part of this team for the last three years. There are a lot of things that we did very well, especially at the beginning. You know, when we look at a lot of the economic changes that were made, it's why our economy is doing so well, why our unemployment rate is now at the lowest point since 2015. So there are a lot of things that our government did exceptionally well. What I often hear from people is that they want to see a different tone, whether that's our party members or Albertans, they want to see a different tone, a different approach to communications that often Oftentimes, it's not even the decisions that government has made that has people frustrated, but how decisions were made, uh, how they were communicated, and making sure that Albertans that are party members feel like their voice is being heard at the decision-making table. Now, I, I want to. I, I like the policy talk. I love policy. That's that's what I got into journalism for is to talk about policy. People usually tune out during the policy talk, but this is where I thrive. <laughs> I want to talk about the recent policy announcement that you made, uh, if I'm not mistaken, June 30th. So yesterday, as of recording this, um, about helping families and helping small business owners. As a small business owner myself, I, 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 I thrive when people talk about small businesses. 
Can you talk to me about your three-point plan to help Albertans during this tough economic time when we are seeing prices of gas, food go through the roof? Yeah, and you know, that's exactly what I hear. That's exactly what has been top of mind for Albertans, whether I'm door knocking or I'm at different events across the province. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of candidates in this race are talking about, you know, COVID or sovereignty. And yes, I mean, those are things we can address. But what is absolutely top of mind for Albertans and for our own party members is cost of living, inflation, affordability. And while we as a provincial government don't really have the ability to impact federal monetary policy, uh, what we do have the ability to do, especially during a time when, you know, things are good, we absolutely have to have a plan for balancing the budget, paying off debt, uh, investing in our future through the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. And, and I've told reporters, you know, more, more to come on that from me next week. But I really want to address the issues in the order that we're hearing them from Albertans. So affordability. Um, right now, and I can tell you this, uh, a gallon of milk is six bucks, right? Filling your car costs a hundred. That is expensive. I have two young kids. Um, and I do hear this every day, whether I'm at the grocery store or the playground, or like I said, knock it on doors. And so I wanted to come forward with a plan that addresses those affordability um, pinch points for people in a way that the provincial government does have the ability to do that. So first of all, for every single Albertan, um, you know, making that adjustment, fixing the indexation of the personal income tax. So every single person in this province can keep a little bit more of their hard earned paycheck in their own bank account and not hand it over uh, to the treasury at a time when the government is doing very well and people are not. Secondly, you know, being here to represent young working families and all of the work that I did on the child and youth well-being review, the mental health and well-being and the physical health and well-being of kids and youth and families has been impacted over the pandemic, right? Whether, you know, because of the pandemic or health restrictions, that is something that we heard over and over again. So an incentive to get people back out there in activities, whether that be you know, when I look at kids, for example, it can be hockey or it can be soccer, skating, dance, or things like piano, right? Anything that can really help um, bring back the spirit of our young people and get them into things that they can be passionate about and, you know, help families get back to normal at a time when, you know, what's keeping parents awake at night? It's the cost of everything in their household and helping them put their kids in activities. I mean, I was that kid. Uh, my parents made hard decisions when we were growing up. I know what that was like. Uh, and, you know, I just really feel like it's important to help families. Lastly, small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of Alberta. You know, we talk about the Alberta entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we have thousands. Th this benefit will help over 100,000, 110,000 small businesses in businesses in Alberta, but also make us one of the most competitive provinces uh, in Western Canada. So a two year tax holiday on that business tax, reducing it from 2% to zero, um, will only cost the government $270 million. That money will absolutely go right back into our economy. Uh, but it represents small businesses at a time where their cost of living is going up as well. This will help them uh, reduce their costs, continue to hire people and offer goods and services to the people of Alberta. One of the things that a lot of Albertans are struggling with right now is this leadership race doesn't end until October and then the party will have to unify, but they're struggling now. So it's not October they're struggling, it's now they're struggling. So while you're crisscrossing Alberta, talking to Albertans, you still need to be advocating for Albertans about what you're hearing to the current government, to your peers, to your colleagues. How does that look like for Rebecca Schultz? How has ensuring that what you're hearing on the ground is getting uh, relayed to the people in power in cabinet right now who are making the decisions on how to best affect the struggles that Albertans are going through right now. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I've never shied away from from sharing my opinions. I mean, I'm still an MLA. I'm still, you know, part of this amazing team while I'm still working very hard to earn the leadership of this party. And, you know, for me, I mean, I know government also made an uh, announcement this week around affordability uh, to help support kids. Uh, I just, and, and that's something I have been an advocate for, um, you know, and I think that's a good first step, but I still felt like my proposal is maybe a little bit broader. And so that's, that's something that I raised, but, you know, I still every single day share what I am hearing 
um, at the decision making table. I'm still a member of caucus and uh, I'm always happy to share the feedback that I hear with Albertans with my colleagues. So you can rest assured that doesn't stop now. Now, you've talked about the struggles that the Albertans are going through with the cost of increase of prices like gas and food. But I want to talk about Alberta as a entity right now, because if you go and talk to people in here in Calgary or if you go talk to people in Lethbridge or up in Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, in smaller communities like Hannah, you're going to hear something different about the struggles that their communities are facing right now. How do you, as the potential next leader, address the diverse struggles that different communities are going through right now? And how will you best address all Albertans' issues instead of just the people who vote for you? You know, that's such a good question. And I always tell people, even in my own constituency, no matter what your political views, when I'm your elected representative, I am here to represent you regardless of how you voted. Um, you know, that said, we're in a leadership race and I am traveling right across the province and you're exactly right. Different areas of the province have different uh, struggles or different opportunities or different things that they want to see, different challenges with government or how things are run. Um, you know, formerly as a minister of children's services, I mean, that's one of the, the key issues when we're designing any policy or program that, you know, we need to make sure that, I mean, as a conservative, I need to make sure that there is transparency and accountability in the dollars that are spent. And people know that through the programs that are developed that we can see their hard-earned tax dollars, right? It's not government money, it's people's money, is being invested in a way that has a very real impact on the people it's intended to support. Um, that said, we also have to have some flexibility in how programs are designed. And I think what this also comes down to is relationships, whether that's relationships with the business community, relationships with municipalities to address local needs. A lot of the things I hear in education, I mean, you know, one of the announcements I made last week was around EAs in the classroom. And the example I use is that we have a government that often says, well, school divisions make local decisions, which of course they do. And I respect that autonomy. But at the same time, then I hear school divisions saying, well, government doesn't fund us enough. But I think we need to bring people together to say we need kids and teachers in the classroom because that's what absolutely impacts the outcomes of kids. So for me, it's I'm a problem solver. I like taking those challenges or complex issues that people bring up and saying, you know what, as a government, what I want to be able to do, and I, I often talk about common sense conservatism, that, you know, we take those challenges, we use common sense to solve those challenges and offer solutions. Um, and a lot of times what it is, is government just getting out of the way so that nonprofits and business can do what they do best. Uh, but for me, that I think is a different approach than what people have seen. And I think it's something that a lot of Albertans um, are really dying to see. You talk about common sense conservatism, and I guess I should have asked this before we get into the policy questions, but I'll throw it in now because it's my show and I get to throw in the questions <laughs> when I want to. But if you go talk to a conservative up in Fort McMurray or Hannah or Lethbridge or Medicine Hat or Calgary or Jasper, the meaning of conservatism is going to be different for each one of them. What does conservatism mean for Rebecca Schultz? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that means that I'm focused on growing the economy, a free market pro growth approach to government, uh, where really less government is always better government, that we respect the ability of people to have freedom of um, their individual beliefs religion, rights. I mean, I, it's Canada Day today, and I have been talking about four events across the city. And, you know, that message resonates no matter where we were in the city, no matter what group we were, who, who we were uh, talking with at the time. And so, you know, the, the belief that government should be small, uh, it plays a supporting role, maybe rather than a lead. Uh, and that we put a lot of faith in our community organizations uh, to support the most vulnerable, that that matters, right? Trust in civil society, help your neighbor. Um, and then that piece around freedom and flexibility and parent choice. And, um, you know, we as conservatives, as a big tent coalition, we are the party of diverse views and diverse opinions and freedom of speech. And sometimes that makes things a little messy. So the, the key is really making sure those voices can all be heard but that we are unified around what that North Star is, which is economic growth, um, hope, opportunity, 
Um, you know, I'm somebody, like I said at the beginning, I came here from Saskatchewan. I love that promise of Alberta that if you're willing to work hard, you can be whoever and whatever you want to be. You can chart your own path. Uh, that's something that I feel really strongly about. And I think the vast majority of Albertans agree with that as well. So, you know, I think, I think most people too recognize that our diversity is in fact a strength, but we have to stay focused on what our top priorities really are. Now, uh, going back to some policy questions here, and I, I guess the big one that a lot of Albertans are struggling with right now is natural resources and getting them to market. Because mm -hmm. uh, we have a federal government, and for transparency's sake, I think everyone knows who's listened to the show. I ran for the Liberals. I'm not a Liberal anymore. I've lost the sense of what that party even stands for. But you negotiate it with Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland and the Minister of uh, Children's Services and Families in federally. How will that be? better you as a chief negotiator for major pipelines when it comes to dealing with the federal government? Because a lot of people are saying, if Jason Kenney can't get it done, who can? Mm -hmm. Why is that you? Well, and I, I would say that of all the candidates running, I am the only one with that experience. I mean, and when we talk about common sense, this is actually a good example of common sense conservatism. I mean, is this the perfect program that I would have designed if I had absolutely carte blanche? Probably not. And I've said that before to the media, you know, however, there was a point at which I said, look, there's a lot of things that I disagree with that federal liberal government on, but the importance of childcare is something that we agree on. It's something that Alberta families wanted to see supported. Alberta families were not going to be okay with $4 billion of their hard-earned tax money sitting in Ottawa to pay for childcare in every other province across the country, except here. That's not something that Alberta parents were going to be okay with. So we did fight uh, for a deal that included, for example, private operators, small business. 70% of the spaces in Alberta are privately operated. We didn't want to make that distinction between nonprofit and private. Um, you know, and we, and we got that. We got day homes included. We got uh, preschools included, part-time options for part-time working parents or stay-at-home parents. That's amazing. Uh, we also were able to income test. Again, you know, Albertans are happy to help out, but we want to make sure that our dollars are going to support, especially those who are most in need and really need those spaces to go back to school or get into the workforce. So we had the flexibility to do that. I think it was last week, maybe, where the Financial Post had uh, released a story where operators from three other provinces were saying, hey, Alberta got a really good deal. We wish we had that deal. Um, but I think what that comes down to is Albertans don't want headlines or tweets. They want results. And I think a lot of the times, you know, we get caught up in the, the narrative and, you know, I pulled together uh, what I believed was a plan that they couldn't say no to. Something that said, look, I get your goals, but you also have to get Albertans. Made in Ottawa, made in Quebec, anything is not going to fly here. And, you know, those conversations were fascinating and interesting and sometimes difficult. But, you know, we, we got there. And so I think our approach when we talk about how, what does that look like, both on the energy front, but just autonomy in general, how do we stand up for Alberta when it comes to Ottawa? I think one of the things I often say to people is there are steps we can take. There are. Um, when it comes to energy, it's recognizing Justin Trudeau will never be the advocate for oil and gas. And, you know, the premier right now and my colleagues in energy and environment are doing a great job of saying, you know, we're just going to go around the federal government and tell our story, work with state legislators in the U.S., work with other provinces who also want to see pipeline capacity, even, you know, not just now for oil and gas, but in the future for things like CO2 and hydrogen, it's going to be needed for the energy sources of the future. Um, but I think the key piece we can take from that too is who are our allies? Because anytime we can take that discussion on as an army rather than an individual soldier here in Alberta, I think that's a benefit um, for Albertans. You talk about who your allies are. We currently have a premier in BC who is leaving, Premier John Horgan, who has announced that he's stepping down. Uh, the new leader may come in and be more anti-oil and more anti-pipeline than Mr. Horgan might have been. Uh, we have Premier Francois Legault, who's going to an election here in October. All polls are saying that he's going to be reelected. Another premier who is not is saying, I don't want a pipeline through my province. How do you negotiate with someone who is so firm in their stance on, we don't want what you're selling us? 
Yeah, and you know, I think that's a complex issue, but I think it's it's not as simple to say that the only issue that we're also going to work on um, is that. But I think that there's some give and take with what we're seeing right now in Russia and Ukraine. Um, essentially what Albertans have been talking about in terms of the world needing more Canadian energy, more Alberta energy, um, that's something that, you know, however you feel about the future of energy and net zero and ESG, which I mean, obviously I do believe coming from Alberta, we have a great story to tell there on the environmental front. Um, you know, in fact, Alberta oil and gas is a win for the world when it comes to emissions um, and, you know, taking care of both people and the environment. And that's where those discussions, like I said, with other jurisdictions are really important um, because the question isn't, do we support Alberta oil and gas? I mean, people continue to use oil and gas. We are, you know, seeing an energy shortage around the world. The question is, would we rather get it from Canada and Alberta or from Russia? or Saudi Arabia. And I think those are the discussions we have to have. Um, but there are other areas too, where we can step up um, and push forward on autonomy. I mean, you know, people have raised the idea of an Alberta pension plan. I think that there's a lot of validity to that. Uh, we have a young population. Uh, we have a low unemployment rate. People are working, there are jobs and opportunities. And, um, you know, that would actually be a benefit. I, I would wanna make sure that that's a benefit out into the future, make sure that Albertans have a say um, and that they feel like they understand the issue because anytime you talk about pensions, obviously, right? People, people care. Um, you know, there are some interesting things we hear a lot about firearms. I, we have a chief provincial firearms officer. I think there are some things we can do uh, around that to better position us where we have autonomy over the decisions that happen here in Alberta. So um, it's definitely a complex issue, but finding allies is important. And I will always stand up and defend Alberta's constitutional rights as I will always stand up and defend Alberta's energy industry. One last question before we start wrapping up here, Rebecca, and that is the UCP is heading into a fall where the leadership race is going to be getting more interesting. Uh, you're going to be electing a new leader in October. And then you'll, the new leader's job will have to unify the party after a large field and win the next election. Um, I, I got to ask the question, why, do, why are you the best candidate to unify the United Conservative Party after a f kind of a turbulent year uh, with Jason Kenney and win the next election in 2023? I think, first of all, showing that we have a path to defeating Rachel Notley and the NDP in 2023 will absolutely help with unity. And that is my number one goal. It is to make sure that we are united and that we continue to see a conservative government elected uh, next spring. And that's gonna take a lot of work. It means making sure that my colleagues, and I do believe my colleagues right across the province, they are hardworking, they are smart. I know that they want unity as well. They absolutely do. They wanna make sure though that their voice is at the table. We need to do some work on that front. My, my first commitment really was, even before the policy uh, discussion, was to go and knock on 87, um, can, in, on doors in 87 constituencies right across the province, meet with our board presidents, meet with our volunteers, make sure that our grassroots party members know that I am listening and that I don't take their support and their conservative values for granted, that we need somebody who's willing to show humility, not just talk about it, to put in the hard work and can show a clear path to defeating Rachel Notley. And I do think that I'm the best candidate to do that. I also care just as much about policy and, and governance uh, as I do the political movement and, and growing the party and putting in that work to listen uh, to Albertans right across the province. And I think that, you know, that is that is something that I bring to the table. And I know I would be ready to do that, you know, the day after this leadership race is done. Um, my last question to you is this, because we, we can we could probably talk for another hour and a half, two hours about policy and your vision for the province. But I guarantee you there's an Albertan out there who's saying, I like what I'm hearing, but I want to ask a specific question to Rebecca about policy or uh, what her views on this issue is. How can people reach out to your campaign and learn more about you, but also ask the questions that you and I haven't discussed here in the last half hour? 
Yeah, no, that's great. RebeccaForLeader.ca is my website. So on there, you will see our policy announcements as they are made, a little bit of background on me, who I am, why I've decided to do this. And you can reach out and ask questions anytime. You can also renew your United Conservative membership. You can donate and you can sign up to be a volunteer. Um, so, uh, for those who are listening and those who are watching this at a later date, uh, Rebecca's links to her social media, to her website are all in the show notes. If you're driving and listening to this, please pull over before you actually go to it or wait till you get home and do that. But go check it out because as I said, during the municipal election, when our show really took off, if you don't vote, if you don't get involved, do not complain. And I will say that to the day I die. Um, Rebecca, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I'm happy to join you anytime. So thanks for having me. Awesome. So with that, I want to remind everyone, this has been the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, get out from behind social media for like 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody because it actually makes our democracy and it makes our society a better place. So with that, have yourself an excellent day, everyone. Talk to you later. 